No Jumper, coolest podcast in the world. And today we got the one and only this is legendary. Young LA in the building. How you feeling, man? Man, it's it's just a blessing, you know. Blessing to be here. I feel great, man. Energy way up there, bro. Oh, yeah, that's good to hear. You come mm-hmm. out to LA very often, or is this like a very once in a while trip for you? Man, um, for me, um, throughout my career, I've been to L.A. frequently, you know, um, just on doing shows and doing work and stuff like that. But, um, you know, to be here how I'm here now on my own accord, you know what I'm saying? Mm. When I say on the accord is I'm on the independent grind, you know what I'm saying? So got a major, um, I I say major label artist or platinum recording artist, but I'm moving like an indie artist, you know what I'm saying? So Mm. it's different for me this time because I really get the experience, you know what I'm saying, and see Cali. You know what I'm saying? Uh, you know, just take it in for real, for real. Yeah. You, you know, when you're independent, you can, you know, move a little different. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Well, that's interesting. Like, we can just kind of dive right in. But do you feel like when you were, you know, moving around as part of a label or more like having to be concerned about what the label wanted from you and everything, was that, when you look back on that, does that occur to you that that wasn't you and that you were always kind of having to try to fit in in a way and that it just wasn't really you? Um. Yeah, because I feel like... um when you're independent or like not only that when you're dealing with a a, a a label you have management you have different people who fill in roles for you yep. so these people fill in roles and this can be projected as your personality or who you mm. are uh, your manager can have a bad day and do something and it can uh, rub a relationship the wrong way mm. um, but you don't really know but you're going to say Young LA because I'm the brand and because you know that's why protecting the brand is so big mm. um, and so that's what you get when it comes to that um, but as independently now when I come to meet Adam, I'm meeting Adam as Young LA straight meeting Adam. You know, I'm not meeting him on uh, um, the businesses or uh, kind of filtered through a label or, you know, you get to kind of touch me and get to see my personality. And I think that's very important. You mm-hmm. know what I'm saying? I feel that for sure. So just to have kind of a basis of uh, where you're coming from and everything. And I, I've watched a few different interviews with you and I didn't feel like I really heard that much about like your childhood and sort of like those early days of, of your life. So mm-hmm. can you tell us a little bit about your family upbringing, exactly uh, what, what the scene was like when you were coming up as, as like a child? Well, like my family, um, the origin of my immediate family, they from, uh, they, they're from New York. Oh, they okay. from Long Island, New York. My grandma came down to Georgia, you know, mom, all them. So they was brought up in Atlanta. I was born in Atlanta, but I'm just saying that I have a big part of my family that's on the East Coast. You know what I'm saying? That's what, like I say, where my grandma and them come from. So, interesting. Uh, you know, yeah, that is interesting. You feel me? Um, coming up for me was, you know, inner city kid. Um, I did regular shit. <laughs> I think regular shit, all the regular kids did. Shit. Right. I played hide and go see. You know, I did... Um, I did all the regular stuff, um, you know, being an inner city kid, coming up in Thomasville Heights. Um, I definitely was, um, you know, you definitely had an influence, you know what I'm saying? Um, where you come from, I definitely, you know, things you see and where you coming from definitely plays effect on you. Um, mm-hmm. You know, not saying that it affects you or totally, but you get certain things that you draw from that, you know, environment, you know. Um, was, com- it, was there a lot of music around the house? Yes. Um my aunt, my auntie Joe. I still tell this story to the day. My auntie Joe was a musician, and uh, she they had like a group, huh? And my auntie Shorty, and that was like really why I fell in love with music for real. Cause I used to, you know, this my auntie, so I'm young. I'm seeing her do hip hop, you know mm-hmm. what I'm saying? And I just was a fan of my auntie, so my love for her just bled to like she do music. I love rap now, you know mm-hmm. what I'm saying? So I grew up, but she was a big influence. Also, you know, she one of the ones wrote my first rap, no cap. She wrote your first rap for you yeah. when you were real young? Yeah, I know. I know on the back. I say, all oh, the homies on the side say, oh, go Lilo, go Lilo. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It was on some East Coast, but that was like part of the song, you know what I'm saying? Really? That, that I really remember, you know what I'm saying? I still remember that to this day. Did, so. did you ever record anything back then? No, nah, I never she recorded. She never got you that far? Nah, she never okay. got me that far. She just got me to the point where, you know, she wrote it on paper. I kind of learned it. You know, mm. and, so anytime anybody asks me, could I rap? That's the only rap I ever said, like for like, <laughs> for like two years. That's funny. I was actually honestly thinking about that the other day with my kid. She's three months old, so it's it's a far away decision. But I was thinking, I mean, like, you would definitely very much want to encourage your kid to make music and and have fun with instruments and have fun with singing or rapping or whatever they find interesting. Right. But then at the same time, when it comes time to actually record something, 
that's when it actually you're you're immortalizing this moment in time. And if you were to record something like as, <laughs> even as a young kid, it's like I would have to tend, tell my kid like, all right, this this is great, but we we, we ain't putting this anywhere. Yeah, we got to hold on to this. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like, this ain't good. part of the rollout. Yeah, like I gotta be the one to tell my kid that. Like, hold on, we got to pause on yeah, this. Yeah. Good, but it ain't it, it ain't ready. Maybe yeah. one day we'll find one that we put out, but we ain't gonna put the first one we make right. out. Right, right. So so. As a kid, though, did you, did you were you really interested in being a rapper from real young, or did it did it set in early on that this was something you thought you could really do? Like I said, um, watching my auntie Joe, you thinking like I'm saying, just remember you like ten years old, like nine, and that's like a big influential moment. So mm -hmm. like she was deeply in the music, you know what I'm saying? I'm raised by my aunties, I'm raised by with my mom and my auntie. See what I'm saying? So I was fans of niggas. You know, when you growing up, you know you want to be like somebody. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. The closest thing in your family that you were around, you know you observed it. And it was like my aunties for me. And nigga, my auntie a rapper. You know what mm -hmm. I'm saying? So she was the coolest auntie in the world. I can imagine. So just I, off that, I just yeah. fall in love with music. You I know what I'm saying? I was so obsessed with music as a kid, but if I had had like a family member or some an adult in my to, life who was really to the into like that. I used to run to the dough. You know what I'm saying? When they used to, Leland gone somewhere, I'm running mm. to the dough just because I got a hill. You know what I'm saying? Until, mm. you know, you can't be in here right now. I'm at the dough, looking up under the dough. You remember how you were young? You used to really look under the dough like you really were going to see something. <laughs> <laughs> I remember trying, yeah. Or you hold the cup to yeah, the door and try yeah, to listen. Yeah, yeah, like so I was on that, but nah, definitely Auntie very um she, she like she played a part in just me like cause from there on I got I wanted to learn how to do my own music. You know what I'm saying? As I got older, it was like I wanted to write a rap. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? To take to my Auntie Joe. Like I wanted to try to put the words down. So it kinda I used to write like um I used to listen to the Brett, like um and anything I was a fan of at that time, what I would do, I write the lyrics down. Mm. Like, basically, I listen to it on the tape recorder, write it down, and then learn it so I can rap it. Mm -hmm. Then when I go to school and shit, I got verses. So it might not even be my verse, but I'm just a fan of a music junkie. Oh, yeah, listen to this new shit. Yeah. This somebody else verse, but I didn't learn yeah. it good enough to recite it. In yeah. the early days, it's like, <laughs> like just being able to recite a verse yeah. and do a, a, an, an accurate version of somebody nah, else's verse real. is definitely a good step towards... Mm -hmm. Then at some point, writing your own. Mm -hmm. But who who are you really looking at as a kid too? Like at that era in in Atlanta, was it a little bit too early for you to be a kid paying attention to Jeezy and Gucci and shit? Was it was it a, a, a era before that a little bit? Nah, that was my come up. Um, I feel like that's what I was. That's what I came up on on the Ti's, the mm -hmm. Jeezy's. You talk about coming through middle school, how to um high school, uh, boys in the hood. You know what I'm saying? When they had to run with Jeezy and Jody yeah. Breeze, that mm -hmm. was very influential. But um. Yeah, like, even though going back, like, being a fan of music, I'm a fan of music. So I used to listen to Goody Mob. Like, mm. I used to learn them niggas' verses. Mm. Like, CeeLo Green, like, uh, Gip, they had, like, they was on some on some social awareness and, like, being aware of certain shit, you know what I'm saying? Like, back then, and it was like, them niggas ahead of their time. You were fucking with Outkast, too? I was fucking with mm. Outkast. Yes, sir. When we talk about Atlanta rap, that that's almost like the the era that was before the part that everybody remembers. Yeah, everybody talks yeah, about Jeezy and Gucci. Like mm -hmm. that was the and Tip too. That that was like the mm -hmm. the first big era of Atlanta right. rap. People forget right. that like there was a whole lot of different shit going on down south mm -hmm. and everything. Yeah, and you had artists that came from that, like um, you know, from the Dungeon Family and from mm -hmm. the moves like Outkast that was birth. You know what I'm saying? Through that, if you didn't, you know, you probably wasn't a fan of it. Like, damn. Oh, that was bro who was on that um track with you know, so mm. they birthed a lot of stuff. So um that was definitely a strong era in hip hop. You yeah. Know? Definitely. Okay, so you're in high school, like when do you start to kinda make moves as a rapper or really start trying to do this? Um, well, for me, when I got to like the ninth grade, like I fucked up all the way, like in high school. Really? Like basically like not on no I was smart just on some just knucklehead shit you know you get some teenagers who want knuckle mama sent me to school I don't go to school right so I had like a whole fucking semester bro like and I was good in sports and shit you know what I'm saying like at that time going ninth and 10th I was like you know how a nigga play basketball you know mm -hmm. you in the hood you active you know I had you know I was kind of alright you feel me right ninth grade I ain't go to school for a whole semester <laughs> and your parents didn't even know my mama didn't even know bro oh, man I went to the cut and we smoked like you know we, we skipped school and we smoked that yeah. This is what we did, you know what I'm saying, in ninth grade. And so, basically, long story short, that shit fucked up, like, kind of hot. It kind of, I was in a, almost in a hole when high school started. Like, I didn't get paid. Like, I stopped going to school. You feel mm. me? And that's when, for me, it was like, oh, but I got to take this shit serious, serious for real. Because it was like, 
I can catch up, but it's like I got to get kept back. So when I come back the next year, I got to be in 10th grade homeroom. Mm. Like, hell no. Nah. But when you look back at I that. I ain't trying to do that. When you look back at that, are you like, damn, I, I fucked up. I didn't really appreciate the opportunities I had with the sports shit, with the that free education shit. But, you know, at the same time, like, you understand how when you're a young man – Hanging out with the homies, smoking a bunch of weed, mm -hmm. that seems pretty fucking good, too. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, I'm just keeping it real and just saying at that time as a kid, you know, you're 14, 15, you yeah. just make bonehead decisions. Not saying I ain't go to school every day, but mm -hmm. when the principal told my mama I had missed a substantial amount of days, bro, mm -hmm. to where my mama was like, what the hell is you doing? I right. know I'm sending you to school every day. You know what I'm saying? Just being, you know, just mischievous. You know what I'm saying? That's called mischief. You feel right. me? And I think everybody go through that, but um, that put me in a hole. You feel me? So it was like... I was always talented with music, though. You know right. what I'm saying? And um, I think at that time, though, I really took it serious because it was like, okay, so you know you ain't finna play sports, so that that's you already then you ain't eligible. Mm. When I come back to high school, it's like, oh, uh, you know, last semester you ain't go to school, you can't try out or nothing. Like, you know what I'm saying? And I had the skills to actually make the team, but I had made boneheaded. So, you know, I made mm. them decisions, so it was like – now that I look back at it, like, that's how everything was lined up, the the, the kind of, the you know, the go, like, at that time, you know. Because mm. even now, like I say, I have my, I have my high school, you know, I have my high school diploma, you know what I'm saying? So I went there, I was able to obtain all that, you But know? you got the GED recently in prison, yeah, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. I was able to, you know what I'm saying, grab my GED, you know what I'm saying? And for me, that was big, you know what I'm saying? Because <clears throat> this was something that I know I could do, you know what I'm saying? Right. But at that time, I just, you know, as far as pushing what I wanted to push and this is how I wanted to do it, I was courageous enough and ambitious enough to kind of push um, at what I was doing. Right. Um, but around that time, though, were you full-fledged getting in trouble, like real bad shit, running around with guns, all this stuff, or were you just really chilling with the homies smoking and that was kind of as bad as you had gotten at that nah, point? Nah, right? at that time, like I said, in ninth grade, so I wasn't mm -hmm. even that, you know what I'm saying? We wasn't even, I wasn't even that bad. It was like, I was hard headed as hell, like you know what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. Do what I want to do, get up. I might want to go to school today. I might don't. I might want to, you know what I'm saying. And so, at that time, I don't think I was running around getting into all the other trouble. But that was, you know, mischief, and that led to, you know what I'm saying. Now you're not in school, so now you got a lot of time on your hand. Mm -hmm. That's what led to the street streets. You know what I'm saying? Definitely. I ain't got to go to school. No, it's just like shit. I ain't in school, so it's like. So now you weren't in school, you start running around with a different crowd. Yeah, I got yeah, I got time on my hands. So you know, my family, I got family out through Atlanta. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? So I hung out in Thomasville. You know what I'm saying? That's why I really jumped off the porch. At, you know what I'm saying? For me, so it was like <clears throat> hung out in Thomasville. Thomasville is a neighborhood off of Moreland Avenue in Atlanta, Southeast Atlanta, Zone Three. You know okay. what I'm saying? All my career, y'all heard me talk about it. Y'all heard me talk about being on the hill, Thomasville. Woo -woo. You know, so this is where I jumped off the porch at. So that's when the street shit began for me, for me. You right. know what I'm saying? What was, uh, what, what, how much can you say about what the street shit was for you at that time? You were running around selling drugs or doing robberies? Just, just a little bit of everything? Doing everything. You know, the little shit you do when you're young and naive. Mm -hmm. I done did some of everything. You know what I'm saying? Jump out, goddamn, try to try to rob somebody at gunpoint at the train station. This like this this, this young kid shit. You know what I'm saying? Right. A lot of young kids were like, like, you know, you're not gonna get no money. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like just the thrill of shit. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? That that's I, it's I, just the thrill of shit. So you know what I'm saying? Trapping, still. Uh, you yeah. know, you selling two for five nicks something. Mm -hmm. On the hill, you know, selling out, you know, just shit like that. That's how that shit starts. You, you know and I mean? you see it over and over with young kids too, where they just they 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 want to like you know rob somebody, and it ain't really connected to the reality <laughs> of like being able to get away with it, being I, able to make a smooth getaway, yeah. or even thinking that the person's gonna have anything <laughs> to take. But it's like that moment when you realize, like, oh, I can just take something from somebody without, yeah. and they're not gonna be able to do anything about it. That's a very bad, that's a bad moment for a lot of kids. Yeah, and just me just being, like I say, being young, like, you know what I'm saying, <clears throat> being 14, you know what I'm saying, 13, you trying to, right, you trying to do something at a, I ain't know what the hell you think you gonna get at the bus stop. You just right. sitting at the bus they're stop. They're on like, the bus because they don't yeah, have money. <laughs> like what you think you gonna get? You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And that's why I say just you know what I'm saying the thrill. But I think you know a lot of the young people um can relate to that. You know what I'm saying? And even us, Adam, like we say as we're talking, as far as like you say, you still see it today. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? It's just things that you do. You know what I'm saying? Growing up, it's just life. You know what I'm saying? Definitely. But did you lose track of the music along the way, or were you still grinding nah, with the music? music? Uh, uh I still was grinding with the music, like. Mm -hmm. That was always like my hit pocket, you know what I'm saying? Like that was my that like that like that was my baby. You feel mm -hmm. me? So it don't matter if I'm in the hood, like we'll just go in. I probably just they'll put beats on. I freestyle. Like I just love music. You know, were what you saying? getting attention so at was, that was, time? Were people looking at you like, damn, he's kind of hard? I ain't start getting the attention to like. I ain't start getting attention for real to probably I was like. 
18. Okay. So I was supposed to be like with a senior in high school. Uh huh. But she at that time I was getting like a lot of recognition. Um, cause you know we, that you like I say you know you be in the street doing shit now. So you know we going to clubs. We don't supposed to be in. We going to club before we eighteen. Right. You so know, you're feeling like I'm the I'm we, fly as hell for an eighteen year old. None of the eighteen year olds I know are doing all this cool shit. I'm going shit to I'm the doing. club at sixteen. No cap. You mm -hmm. know what I'm saying? We like we in Thomasville. It was a club um, right on Moreland. When you come through the back of the cut, it was called a Libra. Mm -hmm. You hear Gucci or uh, a lot of different people yeah, talk about okay. it, but they mention a the Libra. This was like a just a hood club. A spots you can go to where niggas gonna have their guns on them. This he might. It's just like one of them. You know, a hole in the wall, like a trench club. Right. But you had fun there. It wasn't nothing like that. This was our neighborhood club. You they know? still got clubs like that in Atlanta, or is is the shit too crazy with the cops and everything to run a real renegade club like that? I mean, that you know that shit be is it man like it's Atlanta always gonna have like an after hour mm. spot or, especially with COVID that really gave people a reason that they yeah. had to create their own little hook like nooks you know yeah man they gonna always have an after hour spot um that some shit probably will go on it mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying it's gonna always be a spot like that in Atlanta you know what I'm saying for sure. So who discovered that you had talent? Was it Dro? Oh, okay, basically. Oh, damn, we had got out. Okay, so so what we was on? Okay, yeah, so... Um, you're just 18, you're rapping, you're doing good, you're going to the clubs? So basically, you know, people in the neighborhood know I rap. As you know, if you're around your friends and you're a rapper can rap, you know, people know you do it or whatever. So it got to the point where it was like, L.A., man, we got to just stop being in Thomasville every day. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. We did everything just in the neighborhood. You know what I'm saying? We ain't had no money. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Like, you struggling, you selling too. Yeah, you really got a lot. You know what I'm saying? So um, basically, we, you know, you get born, you just hang out in the hood. But it was like, bro, you too hard to just sit in the hood. Like, mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying? Like, we got to start going out. So basically, Michael Mack, which I call him Uncle Stink, he started convincing me, like, bro, Let's go to the Libra and do open mic. You know what mm -hmm. I'm saying? Just go up there and do one of your songs. Like, and that's where it kind of started for me. We would walk from Tomerville to the Libra. Mm. You know, pay our little money to get on the little list to perform. I might be like number whatever. Go in there, do what we do. That's how I kind of got traction. You know what I'm saying? I was already good like in the neighborhood, but not to like the public people who come to a club because I wasn't performing for real like right. that. I was just had skills to put it on paper and rap it. Um, once I went to the start going to the Libra, I ran into Zaytoven, you know. Oh, so he was the first like seven, successful person yeah. you met like that? Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. I don't know, like seven. One of the greatest people in the rap game, period. Never man, mind Atlanta. That's my amazing human being. A great being. guy, bro. A great guy. Fascinating. Like, man, when you talk about, man, Zaytoven, I mean, just all the way through class act, class act all the way through, bro. Mm. Um, been a great friend of mine for years. Um, to this day, like my brother, my brother, my brother. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But, um, yeah, uh, you know, so I had had that incurred, like, if Michael Matt went to talk, hey, bro, we got to go, you know, and that's what, you know, you just step out and you move around, and that's when I think my talent lined up with just, you know what I'm saying, stuff that was supposed to be my desk, and I met Zay, I killed the club that night, I met Gucci that night, too, you know what oh, I'm saying? that night, okay. You know, that night you had, like, SYS, these are neighborhood, like, you know, clicks and stuff, like, at this time, Zone 6, Zone 3, like, we go to the club together, like, you know what I'm saying, before Gucci Park, like, you could see all of us, like, in the club, OJ the Juice Man, you mm -hmm. could see him at the night, like, you know what I'm saying, you could see Gucci perform, you know, you can, you know what I'm saying, you really had neighborhood, like, stars, you know what I'm saying? Right. But, um, yeah, I saw, I ran into Gucci that night, um, and... I ran into Zay, but Michael Mack, who I told you, my uncle, he already had a relationship with Zaytoven. Okay. That's what made everything gel. So Michael Mack was basically like, look, bro, did L.A. shout it hard. He from Tomerville. He go in. Zay seen my performance. Blase, blase. He wanted me to come to the house, you know what I'm saying, and get beats. Like, he basically, you know, he like he, like he want to work with me now. And so did Gucci come pick you up in the hood at some point? Nah, Gucci pulled up in the hunt. Yeah, he yeah, yeah, Gucci pulled up um in Thomasville. Um this was after though I had already met Zay. This down the line. Now. Oh, okay. This after I started recording music with Zay. And now the music that I'm recording with Zay, this shit starting to hit the streets. Mm. And so you Zay working with like Gucci man at this time. He working with like the yo, he working with everybody who hot. Like if hottest you, producer in Atlanta by far at that you, moment. If yeah. you was regionally hot, then he probably was working with you, even if you was from Alabama, mm -hmm. the southeastern region. You know what I'm saying? You could be from Tennessee. He worked with all those kind of people. So basically, like you know, you go to Zay House, 
you can hear LA music when you go to the basement now because I'm working with them. So you have an artist like Gucci come down there, mm-hmm. or a person hear some you know they might like, or like damn who bro is. And I think that's how it started for me. You and, know what I'm saying? And so was Gucci trying to sign you, or was this before he was really trying to sign artists? It was just like the store was like Gucci was fucking with me. You know right. what I'm saying? When he go down there and hit my shit at that time, like who the hell this little young nigga is? You know what I'm saying? They like, but this little nigga LA from Tumbleville. You know mm-hmm. what I'm saying? And I think from there it was just like. You know, Gucci would come to Tumbleville, like, and pick me up. Pick me up in the All White Hummer and shit. You know what I'm saying? Right. We would pull off, go to Patchworks, and got down all, all the studio. We went from Patchwork, uh, Hot Beats, you know, wherever he'll have um, a set. Like, any kind of recording sessions it. And, you know, Young Ralph, another Atlanta artist, you know what I'm saying? Young Ralph, yeah. Um, we, you know, we were all artists on the rise, like OJ the Juice Man, all of us. Gucci had already kind of stuck his foot in the dirt, you know what I'm saying? Right. He With was the, the biggest whole, name out of the city, pretty much from that world, yeah. With the whole so icy, you know what I'm saying? Going crazy at that time, like that was like it, you know what I'm saying? And so you here, you got me, Ralph, OJ the Juice Man. If Gucci go book a session, he called a knowledge to the studio. Hey, y'all boy, come through, you know what I'm saying? We now we were calling, I, like I say, I'm 18, you know what I'm saying? 19 going, and shit is starting to move like I'm catching traction, you know right. what I'm saying? And um, from there, it's just you know, it's just elevated, bro. Uh-huh. Was, was there anything being around Gucci though? Is there anything he said that really stood out to you, or did he give you any kind of like career advice or, or life advice around that time that stood out to you and that really stuck with you? Like, damn, that's some real ass shit that he just said that I would not be able to figure out on my own. Being around Gucci at that time, like, you got to think, us looking at Gucci, Gucci was already a superstar to us, like a right. Jay-Z. Like, Gucci was wearing jewelry. Like, when we seen Gucci, like, that was that nigga. You know what I'm mm-hmm. saying? Because he was already wearing the jewelry, like, ahead before all this stuff. You know what I'm saying? Like, you could see Gucci at the motherfucking Texaco with this shit on. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah. So, it's like, when you seen, you know, so he was kind of... Man, just you know, just to be around him and see him move, you took so much good stuff from him as far as his work ethic. You know what I'm saying? Cause we, like I say, we up and coming artists, so we seeing Gucci go, like just seeing how he get shit done, mm. how he approach shit, um, the work ethic. A lot of that shit just talk for itself. You know what I'm saying? Definitely, cause it's one thing to make some dope music. It's one thing to be a good rapper. It's a totally different thing to actually turn it into a business and to be having the shit around your neck that indicates that you made enough millions of dollars that yeah. you can have a whole big uh, chunk uh, of that on your <laughs> chest. That, that says a lot to a young kid, especially. Yeah, I did so. So you know he's speaking volume. So yeah. you know what I'm saying for us, we we go into the studio. And, and you know, for me, I'm like, damn, this shit. You know, I'm you know I'm soaking it in. You know what I'm saying? But I know like. Okay, I always felt like I was good. Like, not saying I knew I was hard. You know what I'm saying? I felt like I can do this shit good as hell. You know mm-hmm. what I'm saying? Before I got to Zay, I knew I could do this shit good as hell. Right. When I got to Zay, that was confirmation that, boy, yeah, you on to something. And then I just was confirmation from confirmation. So definitely. So how come you didn't sign with one of them guys, and it didn't happen until you, until you met Dro? I'm assuming is when mm-hmm. you actually got into a label situation. Yep. Why? Why do you think it didn't happen with with? And was Zay trying to sign artists at that time as well? Well, just like I say, when you say at that time, you you thinking about growth. You know what I'm saying? You dealing with Zay. You know what I'm saying? He, you know, he got the so icy, but he's growing at that mm. time. You know what I'm saying? Still making beats. I don't think he was probably in the position where he could just, you know, or even had the experience and knowledge of the game at that time. We mm. just all kids doing something we love to do. Now it seems so obvious. You meet an 18 year old and he's really talented and he ain't got shit going on. You like, hey, you you know, I can help you out. Get signed. I could show you to these labels, et cetera, et cetera. Right. That might have been a little early mm-hmm. for him to be. Thinking on that level huh yeah yeah um and like i say he's just in love with his craft and not and, and, and i think knowing how to do it and just knowing how to do it the right way so i think at that time the knowledge probably wasn't all the way there from you know mm-hmm. anybody's so like like i say we changed like you just doing something we love to do you know we probably have people around us who knew more about the business but mm-hmm. as far as for us you know what i'm saying not at that time because you don't come in anything just knowing the business i don't give a damn what you do you know what i'm saying so you know but i think at that time even with gucci he had a lot going on with his solo stuff you know mm-hmm. what i'm saying <laughs> and i don't think he was really signing artists at that time right it's kind of but because then you find out about like you know he, he wasn't happy with the shit the yeah. way shit went with oj for example right and he, i don't think he was a really solid uh 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 uh, uh, uh a label with a foundation at that time because they didn't really have a label and Gucci was, you know, you know, doing his situations, but it wasn't like how 1017 grew to be in where they manifested, you know what I'm saying? Definitely. But on the other hand, you know what I'm saying? Like I say, going in, you was asking about Dro or that, like that situation. At that time, he signed to Grand Hustle mm-hmm. and he signed to the King. So for me, you know, in Atlanta, it's like, 
with the King, they had a label that was really established. Like you got to think at that time, like Ti was multi platinum. Like all his, like everything that was coming out, like Ti was one. Like that was the like damn. Near. Like we're talking about Gucci, like the hottest rapper in the city at that time. But Ti was a legit pop star at that at, time. At, he had reached a different I'm, level that Gucci was yet to reach. Right, and yeah. everybody, you know, for all of us looking at Ti, you know what I'm saying? At at, 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 at you know at that time and saying King, and so um, I mean. With Dro, I think. Um, was you gonna ask me what well, I kind of got ahead of the store? Or yeah, no, no. I'm but, trying to break it down. He saw your talent, but he actually had the the infrastructure of like, oh, we could actually do business with this guy, right? Basically, like the mid take that me and Zay did had like twelve or I had like fifteen songs on it. Mm -hmm. So this is when I, I'm recording with Zay. So I dropped this mixtape. The mixtape just come out in the neighborhood, like 600 copies. We didn't really have a, like a lot of CDs. We spread it out, and then the music got around to just these little neighborhoods. Dro hang out like in the same spot where I'm from, Zone Three, and I think he got the CD from, I think it was Kent or one of the guys in Summerhill. You feel me? Mm -hmm. Who had the CD? And Dro heard it, and then he fucked it with it. And now Dro was pulling up in Thomasville, coming to fuck with me, or tr you know, trying to solve after you know, want to put some shit together with me. Right. And that's how everything kind of started. So definitely. And at that time, it's like shit. I felt like that was the better fit for me. You know what I'm saying? That what I was trying to do is being a real artist and trying to go to the next level. Right. You know. Um, and up to that point, <clears throat> you had had what some like songs that were popular on a local level, but you hadn't really had a breakout hit that kind of went crazy on YouTube. Even I was already popping in the city from the um like I say, Young Ralph had the Look Like Money record, mm. and Young Ralph was like on fire right then. It was like one of the biggest records when he dropped it. And so when I dropped my mixtape, I had first I filed back, then I leaned down. Mm. It had Young Ralph featured on it. This like the hottest song in the city, like as far as the local clubs, them hole in the walls I was telling you about, the mm -hmm. trench clubs. This was like one of the hottest songs going around. And then I had I Got It. So I was already like popping in like the hood club. Right. When you play my shit, they already knew all the words to my shit. Right. You know what I'm saying? That's just come from, like I say, putting my music out, being in the hood, and people knowing me from my area. You know what I'm saying? Right. To where it's like, shit, if people know you in your area and you got some good shit, these same people going to be in these venues. You feel me? So it was like the shit was going up. So Ain't I didn't exist until ain't after I you already signed with Grand Hustle? Yeah. Ain't I never came. I, I, I made Ain't I after I signed with Grand Hustle. Okay. And was that like a time period in your life where you were just really working, trying to find the big hit that was going to take your career to the next level, and that ended I, up being the one? I think I had just got signed with, like, Grand Hustle. It was, like, in the beginning, so I got to find a single. Right. You know, I'm doing records with other artists, but I'm trying to find a one, just like you said. Mm -hmm. Hey, you just did the deal. You got to lock in and go get you one, because that's when it – and, shh, man, I, I mean, it's like – I promise you, bro, like – not too far in that shit, probably a couple months, that motherfucker came out, you know what I mean? Right, and it's kind of crazy to think about it because T.I. is somebody who's had a lot of success with signing artists. He's obviously signed some of the biggest artists right now and some other hu huge artists over the years. Yeah. But at that point, Dro was probably the only artist that he had signed and really put on till that point, and he had obviously shoulder lean. He had a bunch of... Dro was, Dro was really killing point. it at that time, yeah. He was murking it at that mm -hmm. time. He was murking it. Like, best I ain't smoking like, was like the shit like, right. when he brought a whole new flavor so man he was on fire at that time and you i, I could see how they were probably looking at you like oh uh, dro, dro got all this real creative creative shit like he's doing gangster rap but he's putting all this fruity colored swag type shit on top of it and everything and then they're looking at you like you're an even younger sort of more exciting new version of this like you could be an even more fresh face to put on this label right 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 um I think uh, I came. I, I, I think the. I, I think just the sound, like, and mm -hmm. I think it did mess with what Dro was doing. Like you say, you say stupid fruity colors and all the fruity colors. But I like how you say that from the dressing. That's what my sound was. Right. You know what I'm saying? It was like my whole sound was like so finesse and just like melodies and yeah. melodic fun. It was and youthful. It was, like, it was. It was sort of like intended. Like this is before people realized that if you made records and sort of went with that youthful energetic sound that, that the, the kids was, would react to it now or, people get that or now people really get it like mm -hmm. they not even knowing like dang well, like seeing it like oh it's okay but what is it like but not knowing that this was gonna be the sound like this was gonna be what was gonna you know as far as just changing the sound to a new direction because like, everybody know i came right after trap music like mm. 
I came after like you know like you say the Ti's, the Gucci Gigi's, and Gigi's the super Gucci's. serious. Even Gucci was like able to laugh at him. He was able to laugh a little bit. He was able to put some funny shit in his songs, but not that often. Like especially Jeezy. You think about Jeezy. Jeezy was not playing around. Right. It was straight yep. up gangster music. Yep. Like they just there was no humor to be found there for the most part. So you think about Futuristic Leland, and you think about that sign. That's mm -hmm. like a total night and day, bro. And I feel like that's where it started. Like mm -hmm. that was the start of. Oh, this shit changing over. You know what I'm saying? Like, as far as just a new sound, you know what I'm saying? Something different. You know what I'm saying? Mm, definitely. Yeah. Okay, so you, you make that song, and it's just you at first. And then at some point for the video was where it was made the decision to put T.I. and Dro on it? Um, Yeah, it was, um, like I say, with that record, um, it was actually Shay was on that record. And um, Shay is a close friend, like a Dro in, uh, in our circle. We're trying to do like this thing called the Cartier Boys. Make a long story short, we was going to Thomasville one day to shoot a video. Uh -huh. Well, the police and the Red Dolls and shit was at the gate in the projects. You see what I'm saying? So I'm going to shoot my video in my neighborhood, in the bricks. You feel me? So we get to the gate. 12 is up there. So wow. some shit go on. And Shay got his fight, you know what I'm saying? And goddamn, Shay had like a warrant, boom. So Shay get that situation. He get locked up at that shit. Oh, wow. So... Now I got a record that's going in the streets and Shay on it. So it was an executive decision made through Grand Hustle. Where it was like, we can't keep Shay on it because he gone. He can't perform. Uh -huh. He was taken off, you know, like I say. And then Big Country King was put on the record. If you remember the first, ain't I? Right, okay. That's yeah, where yeah, it started yeah. at. So it was like the evolution of their record. Like, you know what I mean? That's Big right. Country King. And then from Big Country King, that motherfucker grew so crazy that it led up to Dro and Tip coming to do their verse. You ever have a conversation with Shay about the fact that that unlucky arrest basically cost a, a very big opportunity? Um, yeah, like I spoke to Shay, um, Shay DM me probably not too long ago, but um, that's my brother, because at that time, like, you know what I'm saying, he really, like, man, Shay had number some love for me, you know what I'm saying? And he was one of them older guys who took me under his wing, so I fought with Shay, you feel what I'm saying? And, um... I mean, some things happen that we can't change, and I think Shay know that, you know what I'm saying? And, uh, I, you know, he was when, when he came home, I was able to be in position to pull up on him and, you know what I mean, get him something for his B-Day, like that shit felt good, you know what I'm saying? Because when we was trying this shit, we ain't had, you know, you know, so basically, like, Shay understood, you know what I'm saying, that what it was just a, a bad time, and then sometime in life, you don't know why stuff happened at that reason or at that time, but sometimes stuff happened, you know what I'm saying? And that's how it happened. That's the point, and that's the period of time that Ye was in his life, you know what I'm saying? Mm, definitely. And so around that time, too, I remember just, you know, you know, being on one of the rap blogs at the time and realizing, like, oh, my God, Young L.A. Drill got a tape called Black Boy, White Boy Swag. This is crazy. Like, I never heard, I never heard a rapper, like, joke around, you know, especially like a real street rapper. Nah, I meant that. Joke though. around about some shit like that. Or, nah, you know, was, put it out there like <laughs> that. Like, yo, I'm like kind of like a white boy with the crazy ass outfits. That, or, or Dro was more representative right. of the white boy thing because he was wearing all the polo and shit at the time. Or Well, it was just like black boy, white boy was birthed at the Ain't I video shoot. Oh, really? Um, so basically, if you go back to the Ain't I video shoot, you'll see me with the gloves on, with the fingers out. It's rock star. I'm in there with the mohawk on. Right. Just different cultures of, you know, rock star and rock and, we you know, blend and, and meshing two different genres together. Right. Not through my sound, but through my look. Mm. I'm already on there with the chucks on. I got the fitted. You know what I'm saying? Skinny pants then. You see what I'm mm -hmm. saying? And that's what um, Black Boy, White Boy was. I remember the woman came in. I had the gloves on. She was like, you got the gloves on? She was like, and so I said, I was like, oh, yeah, did that Black Boy, White Boy shit. And from there, like, when, like, me and Dro in the room, it was like that shit was birthed. That's where it got birthed at. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? Popping lingo and talking shit. You know what I'm saying? And Black Boy, White Boy, it stuck with me. You know what I'm saying? To this day, when people see me in Atlanta, it's Black Boy, White Boy. You see what I'm saying? Black Boy, White Boy, Leland Austin. I feel like that was something that was one of like one, one of my biggest statements, you know what I'm saying? Right. Futuristic Leland, Black Boy, White Boy, Leland Austin. You feel Did you me? find a lot of white kids really liking the idea of that? Yeah. Like, like damn, he's talking about yeah, us. We don't get disgusted in rap music too much, but yeah, you Yeah, liking the out. music, you know what I'm saying? We going in Hollister, they rocking the Hollister, we going to American go, Evil, yeah. you know what I'm saying? We making it cool, you know what I'm saying? Because at this time, like, that's, that's not what was getting worn, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And so we just tried to, like, me being a creator, right? How can I mesh these genres? You see what I'm saying? And get, you know, a fan base because you can gain a fan not only through what you're saying, but through your look. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? 
if I look a certain way or a, a little bit like you, you know what I'm saying, I can gain it because we have a common interest, you know what I'm saying, through what I see or through what I hear. You feel what I'm and, saying? And that mentality. And that's how I built myself. Now we're so used to seeing rappers being obsessed with fashion and taking weird risks, painting their nails, all kinds of crazy face tattoos, different colored hair, et cetera. And that, mm -hmm. was, that was all new. Like you having a mohawk was shocking at the time. The little, yeah. the little baby mohawk, too. It wasn't nothing too yeah. crazy. I had, now you got rappers with a two-foot mohawk. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Mohawk with the colors, you know what I'm saying? Just being different, you know what I'm saying? And I think that's what a superstar is. I think that's, I mean, like, you know, um, you got to be able to stand out, you know what I'm saying? And be comfortable in your skin also as you're doing it. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? This really me, you know what I'm saying? And so it wasn't like a gimmick, you know what I'm saying? It's still in here to the day. You see, it's all tight way, you know what I'm saying? Like, this is my style, you know what, mm -hmm. what I'm saying? So, you know, you got to stay true to yourself. It is crazy how, how much of that shit just sort of became the norm relatively <laughs> quickly, where all of a sudden, you know, Everybody got some some low crotch pants, some super tight leather looking patches all over the shit, like all kinds of different stuff. It yep. became very quickly, it, it became the cool thing to experiment and look different and, and want to stand out. We told them it was futuristic. They didn't believe, you know, futuristic Leland. We told them them then, you know what I'm saying, 2009, mm -hmm. 2010, you know what I'm saying? And now we see the culture and the trends as strong as they ever been, mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying? And so, you know, it's dope to see it, and it's dope to see that, you know, your time, your, I mean, your, you just everything you're doing stand a test of time. You feel me? Like, the same way we popping it, it's the same shit that's going on, you know? So Definitely. And just trying to stay recent, man. You know how that is, like. Yeah, no, you gotta definitely. stay trendy. How you present yourself is just a huge part of getting people to pay attention these days, in yes, particular. Sir. But so, okay, now all of a sudden you're you're not just young LA. You're young LA who has the potential to be the next big star on, on Grand Hustle. So, do you feel like everybody at the label and stuff? Do you all of a sudden have label people trying to get in your ear, trying to switch shit up? Did it did it change the the feel once you had a whole bunch of people in your ear trying to tell you what to do with your career as opposed to just sort of doing your own thing? Um. I think when the situation like that, it always switches up. And then I think too, you know, taking into consideration, like I say, you know what I'm saying, doing it as a baby, you know what I'm saying? And being naive, being immature, not like you don't know, you know, just, just you know, just saying that. So at that time you can be persuaded or, you know, you can be manipulated when you're young. That shit happen all the time. Like it's just, you know, that's the thing of immatureness, being naive and that's, you know, you only conquer that with growth, you know what I'm saying? So I don't think it really changed. Um, like, I think I start to just see shit differently, you know what I'm saying, and see different things, you feel me? But um, it didn't really change because, like I say, no one can make you do something, but you can be persuaded in situations, you know what I'm saying? Mm. And you know people use certain things to play on. You know you sign, you in business with them. Everybody don't really have your, you know what I'm saying, best interest, you know what I'm saying? And mm. that's with anything you're doing, you know, in, in any job you work on, you know, so. Like, the story I p heard you put out there was that basically – ain't i went ridiculously huge but then your next single didn't perform as big as that one and they sort of shelled you just off that which is pretty crazy when you think about how rap music is these days where it's like if they have a hot new artist and you know the second single doesn't work it's like all right single number three single number four yeah, what, you, what keep, you gotta do you keep going you I'm pump it out to streaming services I'm you make a video and that's it. Like, you got to just keep pushing. You're not going to give up on your investment just because one single didn't work, right? I mean, Ain't I as a platinum single? Like, this was before the curve of streaming, before, you mm -hmm. know, we came before that whole wave, before all the um, mannerism switched up as far as shit going to streaming. It's not downloads no more. It's not uh, ringtone sales. Like, if you, if then if you sold a million ringtones, that means a million motherfuckers bought the ringtone. Mm. You see what I'm saying? But if it was you like had a, a platinum single, that mean got them a million motherfuckers downloaded the single for right. whatever it cost it. But at that time, it was like a song had to be huge for them to really be making money off it because now you could have, you could be like a mid-tier trap style artist and just have a dope catalog on Spotify and mm -hmm. then you do YouTube videos, you do shows, boom, you got a career. Yep. You're cool. Yep. But yep. The, like the label, like at that point, it was either you were huge yep. or you were nothing. Yeah, people had to physically go do it. You know what I'm saying? They had to move, you know? I'm saying like you say a stream like a couple seconds is a stream so they don't even got to listen to the shit you know what i'm saying um but what i'm saying is like then it was you really had to do that you know what i'm saying so i you know i came in in that era so i feel like hey yeah you supposed to keep pushing i already i showed you the hard work you know what i'm saying mm. you know what i'm saying they biting on it hottest single going right now and second single really wasn't a 
it really didn't do bad if you look at where it ended up and where it charted it. You feel mm. me? I feel like that was a success. I like I feel like both of my releases, like on all mainstream releases, I had nothing but success because that record sitting at gold right now. You know what I'm saying? Right. So it wasn't bad, but I it you know, at that time too, you had Michael Jackson. It was a lot of different things that factored into that shit too. Michael Jackson. Yeah, you know, he, he had was passed away. The, no, oh, he had passed okay, away. Okay. You know, like when a big artist passed away, like they locked the airways down. It's just straight mm -hmm. Michael Jackson. When you're trying to get a record to go for ads at radio, that means the radio that record has to be getting played. Right. But we dropped the record getting added, looking to pick up steam in, in the middle of that. And not only saying that, remember when they did all the cutbacks, I think in 2008, 2009, and all these big labels, yeah, yeah. where everybody who was working my album just got fired. Yeah. I ain't have really that shit was crazy. But what I'm saying is things happen and they post you know they supposed to happen you know what i'm saying when i was speaking to travis porter the other day their story is super similar to that <laughs> too where they okay. they had a label give them a million bucks or whatever and then uh -huh. all of a sudden the label just decides that they're going in different ways and all of a sudden the people who own your contract don't really care about you so much and they're just not really trying to go crazy pushing your shit right 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 yeah but so that that was one interesting conflict you had back around that time was with travis porter though how, how heated was that and do you think that they just heard the black boy, white boy thing and just decided they thought it was hot and wanted to run with it or you think it was intentional uh what, what was i that mean about? you really can't say at that time you mm -hmm. know what i'm saying i don't you know you can't say if it was intentional but we know it, you know definitely we know what we was doing and saying was very influential you know mm -hmm. what i'm saying and at that time it's like when you hear that it's so new like we just had said this at the video, so we're like, whoa, that's right. still in like at that time, just how that you know that's how you gonna feel just mm -hmm. off the rip. Like, whoa, that's too new. And you know that this it. You, mm -hmm. you like like you know this lingo got ring to it. Like you know like this some shit you can pop and people can kinda got down draw to it, as you can see right. when we dropped the Black Boy White Boy album, like one of the biggest street albums of my career. You yeah. know what I'm saying? And it's crazy too, cause now we're sort of used to everybody jacking each other's ad libs and slang and shit. Like if, <laughs> if one rapper comes out saying some some hot shit, it's like none of us are even surprised when there's ten other rappers saying the same shit a week or two later. Oh yeah, nah, definitely. Definitely. Yeah. And um, I think, you know, that's something you learn, too, as you in the game, like mimicking and mocking, like it's part of it. Mm -hmm. Um, No matter how you like it and you want to say, oh, I'm original, this person sound like this, that's just what happens when you got a good sound. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, people going to do that. I mean, so, you know, you understand that, though, as you go. You know what I'm saying? When you young, you don't want to hear that shit. Oh, he buying hell now. Nah. Right. You know what I'm saying? But, you know, like I say, as you get to a different level, it's like, okay, yeah, okay, I, you know I'm the wave, I'm starting a wave, and as when a lot of people do it with you, it make the wave stronger, you know what I'm saying? Like, mm. for real, for real, so, I mean, it's just something you gotta deal with in the game. If you hot, niggas gonna bite, niggas gonna try to sound how you deliver it like you. They might not do it all the way, but, you know, they gonna try to take bits and pieces, but that's how music go, and I think everybody have done it or do it, you know mm. what I mean? I feel it. So where exactly were you at in terms of your relationship with Grand Hustle and everything when the situation with duct tape started to unfold? And and how did you actually end up being around those guys and starting <laughs> to get cool with them and all this shit? Because this, for me, like I was already a fan of the music, but this was around the time period where you know, me and a million other people were all just staring at Worldstar like, holy shit, what is unfolding? We weren't really used to seeing rap beef shit sort of turn street shit unfolding on the internet at that time. It was kind of right. new to us at that time. All right. Oh, you so basically in the relationship with Grand Hustle, I had already like kind of severed the ties, you know what I'm saying? So I was on to you know what I'm saying? While I'm still got, I still still got, you know, I'm still buzzing. You know, I got, you know, name already built, got one of the biggest songs. Ain't I still, like you say, thriving. So I'm going on to, you know, make my transition. You know what I'm saying? Severing ties from Grand Hustle, I'm going into the next chapter. You so you I mean? had already kind of got disgruntled with this. Because the narrative that was sort of put yeah, out I, there at yeah, times I had was. Already, I, I had already distanced myself mm -hmm. from, you know, from Grand Hustle as far as, you know what I'm saying, where I'm going on my next step and how I'm doing business. So okay. I had already kind of made that pull. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. And um, so with the duct tape, like, that was my, like, real, like, real shit. Like, I fuck with Black. Like, I fuck with Dada. I fuck with so many. I fuck with Dave. Like, these personal guys that I, you know, I, that I really know. So at that time, when they came to Pittsburgh, which is on three, on front zone three. So uh -huh. when they had a spot in Pittsburgh and I was running into Dave, like, it made perfect sense for me for what I was trying to do. <clears throat> I had big movement, duct tape, big crazy movement. You know what I'm saying? Um, I already, like I say, had the relationships and rocking. So I'm like, I'm looking at my star power. I'm, a, I'm always a thinker. So I'm like, damn, that'll be too hard. Got the star power. I'm already gone. They having a real movement, put that shit together. You see what I'm saying? And that's what it was supposed to be. Was, Just as simple as that. Was the movement at that time? What artists were they really pushing? Was Trouble even really out yet at that point? 
Uh, nah, Trouble was just coming home. Okay, right, right. But right. you know, they had Ali. You right. know what I'm saying? Me and Ali already had records prior to all that going on. Like, you know what I'm saying? That's why, like I say, in the city, we say some shit like this. If you know, you know. You know what I'm saying? But, like, me and bro had already had records, like, and all that shit. Like, I'm on the Bid record. If you go look up Bid, me and Ali, boy, um, got records with me and um, Super um, and Ali. Like, we was already fucking around then. So, it's a comfort zone. Like, this I'm fuck with these folk. But I don't know. I think as shit kind of escalating, you do something. Like, when I got the tech, um, I just feel like... And this was something that was already uh, that was chopped up too, like with Dave and Black. Like, oh boy, I'm fucking with y'all. We finna go on and lock this shit in for real. But right. ooh, 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 I'm finna go get the ink. You feel me? And I think as it kept going, I, it, it it just didn't sit right with that individual. And he just was on, you know what I'm saying, what he mm-hmm. wanted to do. You know what I mean? Well, a lot of times <coughs> I feel like with rap labels, there's like <coughs> the business side of things. And then a lot of times there's like the street side of things. And it might kind of be like a blurry line between like exactly like, is this a label? Is this just a crew? Is this, you know, is this the business side of things? But then there's also a bunch of hard ass dudes who are looking at this thing like this is their whole identity and they don't really take lightly to somebody claiming that without necessarily going through the right protocols you think it was a little bit of a little bit of that confusion that that nah, stirred it, this up it wasn't you know confusion because protocol like i'm i'm talking to like like i say when i say black and i say like the spot i'm in with bank when you talk about duct tape like that's the it's the guy you feel me right and, you know you talk about dave like these are the like these are them guys you know what i'm saying so like it was already a mutual un- un- understanding you know what i'm saying with what we was doing you feel what i'm saying i just feel like you know sometimes you never know what person in life like did feel like damn i built somebody trying to come take it stop and shine this time i'm a big ass artist you know what i'm saying mm. i'm not trying to eclipse i'm just i got a thought and a vision you feel me right and i don't think like the you 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 really seen the vision you feel me mm. but around <clears throat> that time there was a like one of the narratives that was kind of put out there was like, oh, young LA is all fucked up on drugs. That's why he's he's tripping. He got this crazy face tattoo. Was that was that a real issue for you at that time? And, and is that something that you could blame for that situation, Parlis? Really? No, nah, I can't even blame it on that. And I don't even say at that time. Um, I think we all deal with what we deal with. Um, and I think you know I went through a phase to where yeah, like when I look back at what I was doing, like hey, y'all was abusing shit. Like mm-hmm. you feel me? If you drink a pint of like drink, like when you just look back at like damn, I bought a pint, about two pint, I'm drunk that motherfucker in a week or two. Like yeah, like I was going. You see what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. But at that time, I don't think that played anything to do with the situation. Cause like I said, I used to be at the spot down there every day. You know what I'm saying? Rocking with these folks. Like we was all rocking. Like you see recently, like. <clears throat> I just did the Bit Fat podcast interview with Black. You know what I'm saying? Right. You just see the genuineness and the love. Like, I just feel like, you know, you can't control, everybody can't control one person or, how, or what one person want to be on the field. You know what I'm saying? Mm. And I feel like shit, when you in the streets, like, street shit do happen. You know what I'm saying? And, you know, that's all, you know, shit get kept in the streets. You feel me? But that situation <laughs> could have played out behind the scenes, but it definitely didn't. It was on World Star, had everybody talking about it. What? Yeah. In that video that we're seeing, though, was that a setup? You feel like, was, was it fully like you got set up like somebody told you you were going there for a different reason nah I just feel like what's supposed to happen just sometimes just happen like I say when you in the street sometimes you get the short end of the stick you don't win every battle like I don't mm-hmm. know no street nigga really like want everything like sometimes you get caught down but like you you get you got the ups you get the short end of the stick that's just how the street go you don't really know you know what I'm saying how it's gonna play out but nah I don't um <clears throat> I don't think that because like I said I used to be at the spot every day you know mm-hmm. what I'm saying this was my first time ever seeing bro I, like I said, I'm over here every day so this day coincidentally like you over there you feel me mm. like and I wasn't announcing nothing I just feel like you was supposed to be over there that day you know what I'm saying and this was supposed to you know we had done built it up going back and forth blah 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 so you've been going back and forth a good amount before all yeah that? we had already been you see what I'm saying and you some, you know some shit come to a head you know what I'm saying and what was supposed to you know whatever expired that was what transpired you feel me behind it but like I say street shit happened to get kept in the street you feel me mm. so only thing about it I had a big name so mine was publicized I understand it but mm. shit if I was still in Tumbleville which we nigga goddamn jump nigga getting out the bus all that I come from them kind of neighborhoods you feel what but I'm you saying you come from the world where that happens and it just happens it's regular it's whatever it's nobody regular. sees it pre-camera phone all era I'm, all I'm saying is regular you know yeah. what I'm saying from where we came from you know what I'm saying niggas got junk and hate, like that shit just regular so basically but I, but I understand though with my with who I am and everything that it get magnified right. so it's all you know that's just what comes with it yeah and especially I mean just you had rabid fans that were like hungry for rap gossip at that time and they weren't really they weren't getting that much versus nowadays is nonstop. There's always a different beef, a different mm-hmm. fucking crazy ass video coming out of some somebody getting a shootout, whatever. It happens every couple of days now. 
at that time though, like how upset were you when the video came out on World Star and what what was going through your head in terms of how like how do I save face from this or what do I got to do to to make the situation right? I just know who I am and all I like say shit, I got to figure it out. You know what I'm saying? Like what's done, it was done. Like at that point when that transpired, that shit I was really done. When it hit the internet, it was like Okay, I felt that that way. Like, I was like, damn, who the hell recorded it? Like, I, that's what part I ain't mm. get. Like, we really getting into it. Who the hell got? Who the hell took their phone out to record this shit? You know what I'm saying? Right. But it's already done. So you know, you you know, you know, you deal with it. Hey, and you keep pushing. Cause one thing about it, you can't soak in no situation. Like, man, two three days later, same day, I'm down there back recording. Like, I'm back pushing. Cause like, I can't. You know, that's. This shit ain't this what happened in street shit. Like mm -hmm. nigga got okay, we moving on to the next. You know what I'm saying? Like, you know, so I think that's where I was with it. Like I, it, you know, it was really like now for me, for my family to have to see it. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. That's the that's the different level at that point. You see what I'm saying? I'm talking about people who love you, you know what I'm saying? Like you got your mom, gotta see you. So for 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 me, if I can handle it, but I don't know how they can handle it. You know what I'm saying? Mm. So it's that's crazy. a whole different story when you see somebody who love you got to see it mm. and hurt from it or got to analyze it or, you know, your little brother got to watch it, your little sister got That's different. Because if I mean? that situation happens and there's no video of it, then it could just be a, a little problem between people who are friends or people who fuck with each other, people who do business together, and you could squash it. You know, shit goes back to normal. But, but then you have the fans all viewing it. Mm -hmm. And the fans who obviously are not about this life, basically feel like somebody has to die in order for this situation to fucking be all right, right? Like, I'm sure you saw those comments. They ain't killing the, shit, and the, they ain't killing shit. Exactly, so that's yeah. crazy, yeah. But, nah, but I, but, but I understand, though, exactly what you're saying. Mm. Now they just have, like, you know, once there's that many eyeballs on it, they have, like, a very different expectation of how everybody, this is supposed to play out, right? Yeah, everybody gonna have their own opinion, you know what I'm saying? Mm. But who really, you know, everybody ain't you saying it until you gotta go, you know, Sit your head down on the wood, you know what I mean? Mm. I go lay it down, but you know, but that's what the that's what media for, that's what entertainment is for, and I mean, sometimes hey, this shit gotta you know, you you gotta mesh it together. Mm, definitely. Um, yeah. So, w w when timeline wise did the situation evolve in which you got stabbed by your girl a bunch of times? Was that after all this, or was that before all this? That was like down. That was down the line. Right. Yeah. That was I, down the line. I just remember seeing a clip where you basically said that that was like when you really fell out with Grand Hustle was when you got into a bad situation like that and you didn't feel like you got the support that you needed at that time from them. Right. Yeah. That 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 came down the line. Mm -hmm. That was down the line after like after that whole ordeal right there. That was like in the same time. But like I had told you, I had already kind of with that going on, had already kind of been distant. So you know, as I'm in my distance, that happened too. You mm -hmm. feel me? Interesting. So did you keep a relationship with Dro or T.I. at all, or, or was there any kind of friendship there still around? Like, um, me and T.I. had no relationship. Really? I'm just saying, like, we don't talk, you know what I'm saying? But did you ever, even back then? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For a little yeah, while? Yeah. You know, for doing business, you right. know. We associates and we business partners, so we're around each other. It's going to be cordial, you know what I'm saying? You know, so at that time, I don't really know them, you know what I'm saying? Like, I grew up with them, and that's so we all knew learning each other, you feel me? Definitely. What about Dro? Is a little closer with him? It's a little closer. Like it's a little bit more personal with Dro. You see what I'm saying? Because I really know Dro. Dro really pulled up in Thomasville. Dro really coming, pulled up in the bricks and sat down with a nigga. Come get me out the hood. Like um, he the one. You know, like I say, put the situation as far as bridging the gap to get me over to Grand Hustle because he was in a good situation over there. So right. you know what I mean? Like with Dro, it's a little bit more personal. Me and Dro still talk. You know what I'm saying? That's my brother. That's gonna always be my brother for life. Definitely. Did you, uh, through all this, was there ever a point where you got disgruntled with the music or where you, you just didn't really care about being a rapper as much? Or, or what, what is your mind state always stayed somewhat consistent? Well, no, you ain't going through life. You know, you got phases where you're still trying to figure it out. You know what I'm saying? The talent don't never go, but it's like, okay, let me best say, let me just figure it out. Like, what, like, like, what's the angle? You know what I'm saying? Like, how I'm going to go back at it? Like, and that's the part right there. You know what I'm saying? I think that's where you find the most about yourself. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. When you figure it out. You know what I'm saying? As far as, like, with all this going on, staying consistent, um, still being tied to your passion, still being tied to your craft, still being able to, you know what I'm saying, uh, work on, you know, like I say, perfecting what, like, what you're doing. You know what I'm saying? Through all that. You know what I'm saying? And that's push power, you know what I'm saying? Mm. So it's not easy to do, you know what I'm saying? But a, but a motherfucker who can do that, that's a motherfucker, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, like I'm when, one of them motherfuckers, you know what I mean? When you look back at like your early days making music, it's like you know when you when you're a fresh slate, it's easy to just be creative and stuff. To actually stay working in the game for all these years, that's actually a real challenge in comparison, you know? 
Yeah, nah, for real, for real. Just like I said, um, when we just said, like, I, you know, one of them motherfuckers, you feel me? Like, and I mean, like, you can't stay stagnant. Like, whatever happened, got to happen, and then you got to keep going. You know what I'm saying? You got to keep walking, you know? And so it's multitasking, but like you say, you still got to, like you say, dealing with life and putting everything together, still being able to stay connected to your craft, to the mm -hmm. zeal of it. To the to the passion of it, to the want to to want to get better, and you know that shit just come from loving that shit. You know what I'm saying? Mm. Like you know, just really having love for your craft and really what you do. And um, like nigga, through that you go goddamn stick with it, nigga, through the highs and the lows or whatever. You know, like for real, for real. Um, passion and love, bro, gonna take you through all that. You know what I'm saying? It's gonna dry you through it. It might be uncomfortable right now. It's like, damn, how do I get through this? I'm going through this in life. Damn, I gotta get this done. How do I get over here to even rap? You know what I'm saying? But it's all, you know, as you keep going, bro, stay consistent. It shit, sometimes it just sort itself out. You know what I'm saying? Mm, but you, but, but you gotta keep that, you know, you, you gotta keep that drive and that energy. You can't let nothing kill that. Right. Because you recently did, what, two years in prison? Yeah, I just came home 2019. 2019. 2019. So what yeah. happened in that and, situation? Man, you know how you go through shit in the streets? Like I say, being in front of neighbor, like doing what you're doing. Some things don't go away. Like some shit just catch up with you. You know how you got shit going on. Might be on probation or, you know, how, how shit go. And you might do some shit early, you know, and you be fighting it, trying to keep it down or shit like that. But some shit just, you know, you got to do it. You feel me? So it was one of those cases that, that, that was like that following kind of you for a long ass time? Yeah, that, that was like a situation where that case was following me probably like, before I did the time, 2017, I probably was dealing with that situation for like four years. Wow. Three and a half years, you know what I'm saying? Like That's 2014. Because we keep, like, you know, there's tons of rappers. Like Casanova is the latest one where it's like he, he's a rapper. He's well-known now. He ends up getting a Fed case, and it's primarily about shit that was happening years and years ago before he was even successful. Mm -hmm. Yep. So that's, a, you know, like I say, back to speak what we, like, just like, like, like what we just saying. Um, sometimes, like I say, you make a decision, and you can't put it away. So you got to just, you know, when it's time to do what you got to do, you got to face it. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? But I hear you being, like, super motivated when it comes to the music um still like you still just seem like you have that energy about it where you really believe that's your calling when you're locked up behind those bars for all those years is it just non-stop in your head like you just thinking about music thinking about what you want to do thinking about what you're going to do next time you're in the studio now that's when you really know how much you really love the shit, you mm -hmm. know what I'm saying? When it's taken out of the way away from you, you know what I'm saying? That's when you really like measure like what that shit mean to you for real, for real. Like when you can't do something like you love and not even like this something you have fun, like I love doing, I do this. Like when you when that shit took it all the way away from you, then you really know how much you really tied to that shit, how much you love it, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. No, so definitely. not being able to book a session or go to the booth, like, you know what I mean? And just even just uh, be around it, you know what I'm saying? The festivity, like, you know, like, okay, yeah, this this is shit I really love, like, you know what I mean? Yeah, no, definitely. Yeah. Um, to what extent do you feel like you're still, you know, obsessed with and, and in love with, like, hip-hop in terms of paying attention to what's going on with the new rappers, listening to people that you've been around's albums and stuff? Is it is it just never really left you? And, like, how excited are you about, like, the the new generation and all the shit that they, that they bring to the table these days? Um, I just like where music going. I think um, now you like, I mean, being unique is, like, one of the biggest things right now. You know what I'm saying? Being able to uh, differentiate or, I, you know, have your identity. You know what I'm saying? And you see more artists being comfortable in their skin. Like, you know what I'm saying? Going outside the box. You know what I'm saying? That's why, you know, and that's what I feel like. That's what makes a real star. Now the so, biggest rappers are the ones like Thug and Uzi who are weird as hell, and they're pushing the limits of, of what they can get away with in terms of clothes, in terms of new sounds, in terms of all kinds of shit. Right, and that's why I say, you know what I'm saying, being outside of the box, you know what I'm saying, and being, like I say, uh, even with like me coming out Black Boy, White Boy, being comfortable in your skin to wear the mohawk, so being comfortable in your skin to goddamn put the designs in with it, not just being comfortable in your skin as far as being original, and mm -hmm. that's something that I prided myself on, so you know what I'm saying, those are two guys I definitely, you know what I'm saying, feel like they are pushing the limit on that, and so when you see guys can be cr be creative and go outside the box, like, shit, I'm all for it, you know what I mean, and when you being a trendsetter, it's all about knowing what the game is too like even with me seeing the game knowing what the sound is knowing what my fans love me for and going back in the bowl again you see what i'm saying we finna whip this shit up you see what i'm saying mm. because once you said trends and known as a trendsetter i feel like you always be on the next curve and that's something i pride myself too so that's why i listen to the new artists i'm always on the music and what's going on as a now you know what i'm saying 100 mm. percent. no yeah i mean it's 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 just crazy when we really look back at like the the however many years of rap music that yeah. you know like the, there was a very 
critical time right there. And it, it sucks to think back that like Ain't I might have been a number one single, you know? Right. If they had been calculating the sales mm -hmm. the way that they do now. Number six, that's what they say, you know what I'm saying? I feel mm -hmm. like it was the number one in the country, you know what I'm saying? I right. feel like it, it did hit number one. But like you say, if the logistics and the systematics was probably like how it is now. The it TikToks been a way counting bigger. towards the streams and the fucking YouTube shit counting towards the streams, all this stuff. That stuff didn't count back then. It was only radio and, it, and sales. Yeah, it was only radio and sales. So, I mean, like I say, to at, like at, like at, at that time, to, you know, have a, a single go platinum where well, you got to, like you say, have radio behind it and you got to make the sales. You know what I'm saying? But like, you didn't have all the other outlets that you name. Basically, you only had ringtone mm. at, at that time. Ringtone's a big business that didn't last that long, but nah, it was it huge for a but while. Yeah, that was like the new outlet as, as you seen shit grow. That was the thing, you know, around that time. And then, like you say, when everything converted as far as kept growing, going into the streaming, the only thing you had back then was ringtone. Yeah. Album sales, ringtone. I mean, you know what I mean? 100%. So what is the the day-to-day -day life of Young LA like outside of, you know, obviously we talked a shitload about your music career, what you've done, what you're trying to do. Uh... What's like your day to day life like, and what makes you genuinely happy? You got kids now at this point yes, too, sir, right? Yeah, yes, I was, yeah, man. I was just gonna touch on it. Just man, just having that time when I'm not on the road, you know, what I'm saying traveling and working, mm -hmm. um, just having my boys, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Uh, beat, beat, uh, beat and pep on 2K21 You know what I'm saying That's one of the highlights of my day You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying You know they think um, Feel like they can beat me for some reason You know what I'm saying <laughs> Wait how that, old are your kids now? Um, My youngest is 9 Oh shit yep, okay my, Yep my youngest is 9 My oldest is um, 13 Right yep. How hard was it to go away for those two years With the kids Like was that particularly brutal Like what kind of conversation did you have with them? That lead was, up to that. And you know, that was super duper. Um, you know, hard, but you, you know, you gotta handle the situation. Um they used to me going out of town and yeah. traveling and stuff like that. You know what I'm saying? Um, so basically I had to pull that card, you know what I'm saying? Really? Yeah. You didn't like, try to explain prison to them? You were just kinda like this is nah, they not they end so up finding out me going on tour, right? <laughs> nah, nah, they end up finding out, you know what I'm saying? But I wouldn't let them visit me. So they didn't really you know what I'm saying? Like I ain't want them to like to come, you feel mm -hmm. me? Cause my boys at the time, like at that age, it's like this shit can really affect them because it's not like they naive babies. They like boys who know shit. You know what I'm saying? So I ain't want them coming to no prison. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, I feel that. You know, so I let mom come, you know, sisters, stuff like that, but I ain't let my boys come. So I had to pull them. You know, I'm moving around, card, uh, doing this, doing that, until they found out, but they end, they still end up finding out. When you, but that was my initial go in. When you got home and all of a sudden you're, you're able to be around them a bunch, did you feel like it took a little while before you were able to really have that same father-son relationship or did it kind of snap right back into place? No, bro, it snapped right back into place. The first day I had a barbecue uh, at my mom's house. I had all my boys, the, my cousins, my aunties, um, just, you know, just immediate family, people who really love me, mean a lot to me. And it was just like, I was like, man, it was exuberant, just a feeling, you know what I'm saying? It's like. I can never put myself in a position, put them in a position to ever even go through that or feel that again, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. um, like, so just wanting better, you know what I'm saying? And knowing better and just, you know what I'm saying, just pushing on, you know what I'm saying? Definitely. Pushing on, thriving and doing better and knowing better, like, never do that shit again. Like, that shit was a, no, like. Yeah, no, that's got to be a, a huge factor in terms of just, like, changing how you live your life and everything. As soon as you pop the kid out, you start thinking about, like, what life would be like for them if you weren't around and shit, it just completely changes your priorities. Nah, definitely. Definitely make you suit all the way up, you know what I mean? Mm. And so, you know, the focus level different, but um, like I say, bro, like how you say, yeah, I still got a lot of in like with the music. Like, it's just like, I mean, is this what just get me going? That's your guiding like light. Yeah, bro, and I feel like right now, bro, I'm making like some of the best music. Like, right, it's like I'm going crazy. Like, I'm in my bag and it's like, I'm still, I'm still creating the sound like it's it's crazy. The range is crazy. Like I can't, you know. So I'm just excited about that and being out and being home and actually can do this shit and put it together. So you know. Hell yeah! No, it's amazing. Um, are you building up towards like a, a release or an album or whatever? On uh, like, is is there a big project in your mind that you're sort of uh getting ready for right now? Um, for this year, for real, for real, we just working on um, all my fans who, you know, been following, you know, me and fans of my career, you know, 2020, like, was a big year for me as far as releases. Like, you know, I released, like, four, five projects last year. Right. Um, and so that's just, that just was me getting my feet wet because I'm back home. So it's like I'm eager. Like, I released, like, like I say, five projects, but 21, we getting the game, playing together. Um, 
me and my big brother Sean, you know what I'm saying? We moving around. We just came from Miami. Um, I got good people around me right now, you know what I'm saying? Just banging out records and just feeling the energy as we just kind of see what we're going to go. I don't know what the single going to be right now, but we working. It's top of the year. You see, I'm out here with you, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's January, so, we man, we moving around and we putting it together. But um, I, I know I got tattoos and jewelry dropping. Um, okay. Been doing, like, I got to do some recording while I've been out here, you know. Um, got to do some recording um, in Florida, so... Just moving around, catching different vibes, recording, living life, man, and the shit going up. 21, you know, it's going to be big. I know I'm going to be working out here. I know that. God, you know, God forbid I'm working out here. No days off. Hell yeah. You know? Do you, uh, so you didn't, like, you didn't like COVID slow you down too much? Nah, really, man. You know, you had to slow down. Like, it mm -hmm. wasn't like you couldn't slow down. You had to just kind of stop and reevaluate and see how the hell you were going to move. You, know you weren't even home from prison that long before the shit kicked in, huh? Nah, that shit kicked in like <laughs> six. I mean, yeah, it was like, whoa, damn, you know? Yeah. But um, just had to regroup, like I say, on how you move. Um, I thrived on just moving around and doing uh, live recording sessions where I just go to these different, go to cities, work with artists, lock in the studio, me, yeah. the artist, the engineer. It ain't a lot of people around. We can social distance, but you can still put your paper together. You feel me? Yeah. Yeah. So. Definitely. Um, yeah. All right. So Young LA, honestly, it was a great conversation. I kind of figured we would always end up doing an interview so I could uh, ask you all the questions that have been in my mind since I was a kid. But yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm very glad that <laughs> we got a chance good. to do it, man. Man, I've always been a fan, Adam, man. Glad to be here. You know what I'm saying? Uh, appreciate your extending your hand. But, you know, it's just the beginning. You know, probably bump into each other again. <laughs> oh, yeah. We got to do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, 100%. Yeah. When I come out to Atlanta, we could tap in 100%. Yeah. Nice. Nah, all good. That's where yeah. you still stay to this yeah, day? Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. I'm in Atlanta. Yes, sir. Amazing, um, yeah, young LA. You got any advice to the, uh, the the young kids out there that are that are watching this that are trying to figure out how to make something out of themselves? Any wise words? And don't just try to do it for the quick hit. Like you can do it for the quick hit. Like mm -hmm. get in and just, but you really just just really know. You gotta love this shit. Like I can't underline it. The passion gonna take you through everything. I've been through like this, that, but the passion that I have for music, like that shit, never none of that. It and nothing I went through never like stopped me because that's how much I love that shit. Mm -hmm. So basically, I'm saying if you ain't willing to go through everything for this shit, then you don't. This probably ain't for you. You know what I'm saying? You gotta be willing to go all in for this shit. So yeah. you really gotta love. It. Much respect, Young LA. No Jumper, coolest yeah, podcast right in the world. Yes, yeah, Sersky. Check us out on YouTube, SoundCloud, yeah, iTunes. Sersky. Like, comment, subscribe. NoJumper.com if you want to support. Appreciate you, man. Thank you. Hey, man, I appreciate you, brother. For real. Yep. My guy.